All right, guys, looks like we're right at 12 o'clock and 20 participants, which frankly is uh, great uh, for the situation we find ourselves in. Um, so thank you guys so much for joining us. Oh, um, so Kathleen, um, so if you, and this is for everybody, if you're only seeing me, if you kind of hover over the speaker box, there'll be like a step of four different things. Um, if you click the third to last one, that'll show a thumbnail of everybody. Or if you want the Brady Bunch view, you can uh, click the show grid uh, video, but then you'll miss the, um, the charts, but the people are more important than the charts anyway. <laughs> All right, so yeah, we're gonna go ahead and get started. If you haven't already, go ahead and introduce yourself and let us know what library you're from um, in the chat. Um, obviously, when I scheduled uh, <laughs> these chats, um, we did not know that um, I'm assuming most of you um, are no longer working from your library. Most of you are at home. So we will certainly take that into account when we're talking. Um, and I'll have some updated information for you about the whole process um, towards the end. Um, but first, I guess I just wanted to ask you all, and if you could just put this in the chat or you can unmute and shout it out, that's fine too. Um, I'm just curious if you all are here out of the goodness of your hearts because you're so interested, um, but your library is not paying you, or if you are lucky enough that you're actually getting paid um, to do these kind of professional development opportunities. Mm -hmm. Can you hear me? Absolutely. Oh, hey. Uh, hi, my name's Aaron. Hi, Aaron. Um, I'm working from home and still getting paid. Oh, Luckily. that's great. <laughs> <laughs> I, I just hate to be pushing people to do things if um, they're not getting paid to do them, you know? <laughs> and if us providing this gives you an extra opportunity to be paid, yay. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, it looks like uh, so far everyone has said the same thing. That's fantastic. Um, you know, I'm sure most of you saw it. We bit a, did a big survey a couple weeks ago to see what shape everyone was in, um, but a lot can change in just a few weeks, um, as you all know. So, oh, excellent. I'm so glad um, that at least it looks like most of you um, are, are still getting paid to work from home. <laughs> and I hope that does uh, continue. Um, so our original goal here for this webinar is to talk to you about the amazing community dialogue strategy um, that you agreed to do as part of our Earth Day celebrations. Um, obviously, Earth Day is in a, a slightly uh, different, oops, slightly different position um, this year than normal, um, but we will, we will work with that. Um, real quick, before I keep babbling, I forgot to introduce ourselves. So I think most of you know me, I'm Annie Holland. I'm the community engagement and exhibits manager here. Um, and I assume most of you know Stephanie too, but Stephanie, go for it. <laughs> yeah, so any of you guys who don't know me, my name is Stephanie Vero Fields. I'm the relationship manager at the Space Science Institute. So I'm here for you guys. Any questions or anything you guys could need, want, just wanna chat, I am here for you. I just heard Stephanie no. offer to deliver a pie to your house. So whatever you want. <laughs> All right, so today's agenda. So um, welcome and introductions, check, we got that. Um, I wanted to tell you guys a little bit about why we were doing our, our Planet Earth campaign. We will continue to do it. Kathleen says she loves pie, Stephanie, I'm just saying. Uh, we will continue to do this uh, campaign in future years. So you guys are just gonna have kind of a, a heads up on what's happening. Um, talk to you a little bit about community dialogues um, and, you know, if you think you might do one when um, we all get to be within arm's reach of each other, again, great, but also want to talk about some options for doing virtual ones, um, which might actually help you um, determine what to do for your patrons right now, which um, some folks have already started doing. Um, then we had a requirements section. This was the requirements for you guys to, to get the stuff um, associated with signing up those games and things. Um, all of those are temporarily on hold because NASA is you know, worried about money and things, um, but presumably you will still get those. The time frame will just be um, a little absurd compared to what you might have expected. Um, and then we'll have plenty of opportunity um, for Q&A as well. Um, and again, just to highlight, um, if you didn't hear me before, if you just wanna unmute and shout out a question, there's few enough of us, that's totally fine too. 
Oops, I keep hitting the wrong button. It keeps blooping at me. So the reason that we were focusing on uh, the Our Planet Earth campaign this year um, is we kind of had a convergence of three big events. It was the 50th anniversary of Earth Day. Um, Citizen Science Month happens at the same time. And as I'm sure a lot of you know, um, the American Library Association adopted sustainability as a new core value of librarianship. Um, again, something most libraries are already doing and already really excited about, but to put the ALA stamp of approval on it um, makes it easier uh, to convince you know, city and local governments to do it. So three kind of really big things happening. Um, it won't be the 50th anniversary anymore next year, um, but certainly all of this will still be true. Um, is anyone still planning on doing any Earth Day stuff um, this year? Um, obviously virtually, but does anyone have anything that they're already uh, planning on doing? You can chat or unmute. Chat. If I could open the chat. Kathleen says, not I. <laughs> uh, looking for ideas for social media posts. Um, so certainly I'm assuming that you're all on our newsletter list since you knew about this webinar, but Greg has been sending out once a week um, kind of a Starnet stay at home newsletter, right? So stuff for you guys to do, but also things that you can hand off directly to your patrons. Um, we also have the opportunity, if you haven't signed up for it, for you to get partnered up with NASA volunteers like the Solar System Ambassadors or Night Sky Network. Um, and they will do free Zoom presentations for your library. I will do a free Zoom presentation for your library if you want one. We have a lot of options. Um, we just want to make sure if you guys are wanting to do these things that you know you can do them. So contact Stephanie um, if you want to get hooked up with the Solar System Ambassadors and check out our newsletter for some of the hands-on stuff. Um, I see Jennifer says they're doing a, a beekeeper presentation. That's fantastic. Um, I know a lot of libraries, even though the Globe Challenge, right, the Globe Trees Challenge, if you're familiar with that, it officially got canceled because the government can't encourage people to go outside. Um, but if you know that your patrons um, are in a place where it is safe for them to go for walks or go out into their backyard, um, you can actually still collect the cloud and the tree data that will go directly to NASA scientists for them to use in their research. So that's another really great thing um, to kind of promote for your patrons. That's very little work um, on your end. Ooh, Aaron said he thought about an electric vehicle expo where people could sign up to exhibit their electric cars to attendees. That's cool. I have a, a plug-in hybrid. Does that count? <laughs> yeah, that counts. <laughs> <laughs> I drive too much to have all electric. It wasn't going to work. <laughs> That's okay. I'm right now getting about three weeks to the gallon, so. <laughs> I'm at four <laughs> weeks. Yep. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> And Stephanie, uh, guys, just posted, if, you haven't, if you've already done this, you don't need to do it again. Um, she's already passed on your info. Um, but if you are interested in having a NASA volunteer present a virtual program for you, uh, go ahead and click that link, excuse me, in the chat box. If you don't hear back from people or you aren't comfortable reaching out, you can always um, reach out to us here at SSI as well. Um, and we could, um, you know, I could schedule something for you. I've done a couple... Um, not Earth Day specific, um, but a couple like exoplanets, and there's a cool activity called Art and the Cosmic Connection, um, or we can get you guys resources so that you can host them as well. Um, just want to make sure you know that you don't have to figure it all out on your own. So these community dialogues that you're here for, um, again, obviously, we know no one's doing these right this second, um, but I said that on the last video, and a couple hours later, a couple people emailed me, or the last webinar, a couple people emailed me to tell me, actually, yes, we are going to do these right now, and we're going to do them virtually to figure out the needs of our patrons right now when they can't come to the library. Um, so before we talk more about those examples, um, just kind of a 40,000 foot view of what a community dialogue is. Um, so these dialogues were actually started, um, I know we have one Colorado person on the line, um, here in Colorado, excuse me, for our Discover Health Descubre La Salud project. Um, I am an astronomer by training, that's what I know how to do, and I was asked to design an exhibit about health topics in Colorado. I had zero idea how to do that, so I went to all the libraries one at a time that were going to be hosting the exhibit, um, and I asked them to also bring their local area health education center representative with them, and then we could talk about what health issues were really relevant in their community um, so that I could promote those in the exhibit. So it was just me, 
library staff and uh, people from this one health organization. And we had about nine of these, 10 of these conversations. Um, as we got further and further and people had more time to plan, they started inviting doctors, directors of homeless shelters, uh, folks from the Boys and Girls Club, all these other folks in the community that knew about specific health needs, um, tribal leaders, right? Specific health needs for specific populations, things that the library staff or even the Area Health Education Center folks wouldn't know about. Um, and that's when we realized we, we stumbled across something here. Um, uh, a different kind of way to gather community feedback, acknowledging that just talking to the people who already walk into your library might not be getting all of the feedback or all the voices that you want and need. Um, so these community dialogues then are informal conversations with community stakeholders, leaders, and members. Um, stakeholders um, would be like in my first example, the library staff and the area health education folks and me, who had a very specific goal of designing a health science exhibit. Um, leaders then are people from outside who don't have a direct vested interest in the thing you're working on. So that might be the tribal leaders. Um, it could be um, someone from the um, Hispanic Chamber of Commerce, right? We've seen lots of different types of people in that leader category. Um, my favorite leader, Stephanie, do you just want to tell the story since you've heard it 30,000 times? Oh, no, 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 but you had a, you had oh, a flavor to it. I do it so well. So my favorite leader was one of my libraries um, from our NASA project who was doing community dialogues told me um, that they invited the owner of the sandwich shop. And I was like, and he's a leader how like is he on city council like i didn't get it and they're like no we're in a we're in a food desert so every single person in the town if they want to eat they either go to him joe at the at the sandwich shop or they go to the gas station those are their options to get food so wow, he hears every yeah i know he hears everything that's going on in the town he knows everyone's ups and downs he knows what people care about um and uh, he was big gossip, so he was happy to come and share it all with us so that we knew what types of things were important to people. Um, and that story is just to point out, sure, not every town's going to have a Joe at the sandwich shop, but who is your Joe <laughs> at the sandwich shop, right? Um, who might not even come to your library, but sure knows a heck of a lot about your town, and even better, the folks who don't walk in the door. Um, so that's what I normally recommend, is that people stick with the stakeholders and the leaders, at least for the first conversation, um, unless you're really good at facilitating a public conversation. If any of you have watched uh, Parks and Recreation, um, you might remember the scene where Leslie Nope is doing a big open forum with all the community members and everyone's just so excited and wants to share their issues. And it means no one can share their issues because everyone's just yelling over each other, right? Um, if you're not really comfortable with facilitation, I really recommend that um, you don't just have a completely open forum. You can invite community members, um, but you know, pick people who are representative of certain groups, right? Like a couple folks from the homeschool population or um, a couple of folks that you know um, you know, come and do adult learning programs at the library, right? Um, completely open admission sometimes turns into a bit of a circus. Um, we want these dialogues then to encourage libraries to reach out to new partners, consider how to better reach underserved audiences and better meet their patrons where they are. Now, I mean, I'm sure all of you can find some version of this right in your mission statement. This is obviously something that libraries are already doing. Um, we're just hoping that by providing a slightly different framework that focuses more on the folks who aren't in your venue right now um, might help to, to reach even a little bit deeper in your community. You guys are already doing better than literally everyone else um, at reaching folks. Um, and we're just hoping to help you reach just a little bit further. Um, so one good example here in Colorado, um, we have a large uh, Mexican immigrant, Mexican immigrant population um, normally end up being kind of migrant workers, right? So moving from town to town um, in the more rural parts of the state. Um, when we were conducting one of these community dialogues, I also went and walked around town with my little notebook um, and just asked people questions about the library, right? Um, and I had, um, excuse me, Marina Lagrave, who was doing our Spanish translation, she came with me. Um, so there are times when um, folks didn't speak English and I don't speak Spanish, so Marina would ask them. And what we kept finding when she was asking very new um, Mexican immigrant families why they aren't going to the library, um, they'd say, oh, well, I can't afford it, or um, I know it's not for me. And we dug in deeper and it just turned out, you know, just because they had just came from Mexico. In Mexico, the libraries are for um, researchers and scientists, right? They're for the university. They're not for everyone. The same is true as Venezuela, in Venezuela. The same is true in a lot of um, Central and South American countries. 
And eventually, right, when people become acculturated to what is normal in the United States, they realize they can go, but those very early immigrants weren't getting the benefit of the library. Um, and in this case, all of the really great immigrant services the library provided, like English classes, citizenship classes, um, and all sorts of things like that. So that's just a small example, even in these libraries that are doing a fantastic job of working with their underserved audience, they didn't realize there was this little subset um, that they were missing. Um, oh, another good, sorry, I'm just going to keep using my Colorado examples because that's where I've personally gone and done the dialogues. Our other good example, um, this was a library down in south of Colorado who was doing, they were trying so hard. They had a large Spanish speaking population and they also had a large Native American population. Um, but they weren't physically stepping foot in the door. Everyone inside the building, every time I was there was white. And that's not what the, the community looked like. But the librarian was really trying and he was showing me one of the things he did um, was that he put a sign outside saying that there was a um, Spanish language um, children's reading area now in the library. And then in the library, a bigger sign that says Spanish language story time books. Um, and when we talked to the few um, non-white folks that came in, the few Spanish speaking folks that came in and we asked, why aren't you going over there? We see you have kids. Why is, is there a problem? Um, and they said, oh, isn't that for the gringos learning to speak Spanish? Like they literally thought because it was written in English um, that it wasn't meant for them because if it was meant for them, it would have been clear. Um, so just little tiny things that one person can kind of spark in your mind having these conversations. Um, and then just the last note here, um, this framework is constantly evolving um, and we hope to encourage more libraries and other informal venues to contribute. Um, if you guys do decide to do a community dialogue, you'll still get your stuff if you can't because of the situation we're in right now. Um, we'd love for you to also fill out um, just a short little report like a page um, and we have the questions written for you <laughs> telling us um, what it is that you got out of it, how you, how you think our framework could be better. Um, and just really cool stories like the ones I just shared so that we can continue giving people ideas of what types of things to poke at. Just make sure I see a chat, make sure I didn't miss anything. Uh, different cultures, yeah. I'm sure that was relevant and it is entirely relevant, but I don't know exactly what it was referring to. <laughs> Back to your conversation about um, the Hispanics not knowing, or the Mexican uh, new immigrants not knowing. Right. Exactly, mm -hmm. precisely. Um, so right now, um, you guys have probably heard of most of these terms. Um, community dialogues are something that we hope one day um, will be situated in kind of a system like this where um, libraries and the communities they're in can create some sort of collective impact about whatever issue it is that you care about. So um, whether that's um, increasing the participation of native audiences at your library, whether it's helping kids be more comfortable with STEM or helping adults be more comfortable um, with STEM and computers. Um, we really hope that it turns into something the whole community can engage in, right? Um, that idea is something called learning ecosystems, right? So the libraries, the schools, the museums, if you have them, community centers, um, they kind of share one common goal. It's not like their big thing that everyone's doing, um, but they have a bit of a shared mission that they can talk to each other about um, and figure out how to um, benefit from each other's offerings and strengths rather than doing each of these things separately. Um, so just a couple quick quotes um, from some people who have conducted community dialogues with us. So Lisa, um, who's at the African American Research Library and Cultural Center in Florida um, said, there's no doubt that the community dialogues are beneficial to all parties. I think this method should be employed more often when we are considering all kinds of services, initiatives, and programs for our community. So Lisa was part of a project where she was required to do one community dialogue and she's done four. Um, I like to point this out because Lisa's library already was doing a lot of this work. They had focus groups, they did surveys, um, but their focus groups and their surveys were almost always limited to people who were already kind of power users at the library, right? It was really hard for them to get data from anyone else. So when you hear from your power users, you get the data you expected, right? Um, and with these dialogues, by bringing in people from other organizations, she's been able to get a lot more um, diverse viewpoints. Um, so in this picture here, the guy that's talking, um, he runs a after school program. He had no idea that he could work with the library to do that. He had no idea um, that the library also offered similar services. So now they're working together. The two ladies in the front here um, are both homeschooling parents 
who come to um, story time programs and stuff. And Lisa invited them specifically because they have older kids that she never sees in the library. So what can the library do to help homeschool populations see the library as a uh, beneficial venue for those older kids as well, not just the younger kids. So she really kind of dug in um, to see what people she knew and people she could get to um, could offer to the conversation. So this was the old slide, mostly not relevant anymore, but I'll go through it anyway. Um, so the requirements for receiving the stuff <laughs> for signing up for the Earth Day event and doing a community dialogue is that you participate in a webinar. Good job, you've done that. Um, once you do your community dialogue, which frankly, if that's not till next spring, that's great um, that you complete a brief uh, reflection report. Um, we'll send an email for that report to you and also post it on um, the community dialogue website. Um, we'll also have a survey for you to distribute to um, patrons, staff who didn't um, plan the dialogue, and your community partners. We'll also send that to you. And again, no time frame on any of this. If you get to do a dialogue virtually or in person in the distant future, great. We want to hear about it. Um, but if this stops you from being able to do that, please don't worry. We, we completely understand. Um, my last request here is to please send me pictures if you can. Um, pictures with some sort of photo release, even better, um, so that I can highlight those instead of just Lisa's pictures <laughs> in my uh, PowerPoint here. Um, so this is probably a good place to um, talk a little bit more about some of the options if you're still interested in doing one um, kind of in the spring summer time frame. Um, as I said, I've heard from a couple libraries who are moving these online. Now moving them online makes it really easy to gather pa current patron info and really, really hard <laughs> to get info from uh, community partners. So if there are community partners that you know are still working that will answer if you reach out to them, great, you guys can set up a Zoom or a Facebook Live or whatever you want um, and have these same sorts of conversations. If that's not going to work, um, then certainly your best bet is to just advertise over Facebook or your newsletter list to your patrons um, and post phrase it more as a, what can we do for our existing patrons during this, right? Rather than trying to focus on um, how to bring in new populations. Cause I think that's just realistically, that's hard right now, um, unless you have those community partners participating as well. Um, so um, one of these online ones happened already last week. Um, and because of it, um, one of the libraries who hosted it, um, uh, two libraries in the same system actually did it together. It was a little confusing um, for me, not knowing the area. Um, but one of the libraries um, is actually providing take and make, take and make, that's the word, um, activities in the lunches that the schools are distributing. So they put together a whole bunch of stuff, let it sit in the box for a couple days so it was definitely not contaminated, and then dropped it off at the place where school lunches were being distributed so kids could take um, a craft home with them. Um, there's a lot of great ideas um, for things like that on the STEM activity clearinghouse that require uh, pretty cheap and easy to get materials. Um, I actually just purchased a bunch of, if you guys are familiar with the activity, uh, UV Kid. Um, it uses stuff everyone has in their house with the exception of some UV beads. So just as a test, I ordered a big pack of UV beads to see how long it took Amazon and it took two weeks. So longer than normal, but you can still order stuff like that. Um, you just have to have a more realistic time frame. Uh, oh yeah, Marie says that her library is doing that as well for both adults and children um, for their summer reading program. Um, that's the other big thing that came out of the online community dialogue that happened last week. Summer reading is starting now. Um, so many schools, um, well, you all know, those of you who have kids, all of the schools and all of the districts are doing everything completely bonkers different um, with regards to what kids are doing at home right now. Um, but it seems like the... Um, the overarching um, pattern is that reading time is getting cut down because it takes longer for them to do things like math and the writing um, and some of the required things they have to do for the testing, at least in Colorado, that they'll be doing in the fall. Um, so certainly I've seen that with my own, my own daughter, the reading time is cut out and we have to do that on our own. So um, starting summer reading early to encourage the kids to do fun reading instead of um, some schools are doing a great job right now. Um, some schools, however, are not making this easy on parents or children and uh, kind of a familiar thing like summer reading where they know they're going to get a prize or whatever is a really nice way to normalize things, I think. 
so you got some more chats. That's a great idea. I often do make and takes when we are open. I was trying to figure out how to get them distributed. Yeah, the, the schools are a really great option. Um, I'm trying to think somebody else. Oh, that was right. Um, somebody else put, a, put, put them all in individual Ziploc bags and dropped them off at the grocery store. And so families could grab them because that's like the only place everyone's going right now, right, is the grocery store. So they can drop pick them up at the grocery store as well. And they're in a Ziploc bag. So it's no different than all the other stuff they're buying. The parents just throw away the bag and then the supplies are all clean. I've heard of the food bank as well. Oh, yes. Food bank would be fantastic. Yeah. Uh, yes, through the school, curbside eventually. Yeah, that's, there are, <laughs> it's fascinating because we know so many libraries uh, to see all the different stuff folks are doing right now. This is away from the community dialogues, but still super relevant. Like there are some libraries who are doing uh, curbside pickup of, of books and kits and everything, right? So there's one employee working and people make requests for what they want, just like you would normally do to place a hold. And then they pick them up on the curb, you know, just like, you know, grocery stores and liquor stores are doing, but at the library. Um, I would not want to be that one staff member, but kudos to them for doing it. Um, so yeah, just things to consider. Um, even if you don't want to frame it as a community dialogue, I would still really encourage you. Um, your patrons like you. <laughs> they love to talk to you. I've talked to so many kids who the highlight of their week has been when their library has done story time and they get to see my librarian. That's what the kids say. I got to see my librarian. Not I got to hear someone read a book. They don't want to hear, hear Neil deGrasse Tyson or some astronaut read a book. They want to hear somebody that they know read a book. Um, and so they've really enjoyed that. So even if you're just popping on to have a conversation with them, if you don't think you're up for programs or doing a community dialogue um, I really can't encourage it enough based on all of the the great things that we've heard both from patrons and libraries who are already doing this which again I know some of you already are soapbox sorry <laughs> I get those sometimes so um, let's go back to the community dialogue idea for a bit and certainly you all can frame this around the situation we're currently in and how you might do these online. Um, so the first big question I had for you is just why you wanted um, to do a community dialogue. What made it sound interesting to you? And again, you can type or unmute, whatever you prefer. Hi, this is Kathleen. Can you hear me? We can. Perfect. Um, I just think that um, if you ask people what they want, then you can maybe deliver it better and um, um, everybody has better library experience that way. Absolutely. Yeah, we don't have to use crystal balls. Turns out people are very vocal if you ask them to be. <laughs> exactly. Any other thoughts? Was anyone um, perhaps interested or maybe now interested in the idea of reaching into segments of your population that um, aren't quite making it? Got to check. Diane says we are all trying to get a larger demographic. Yep. Heidi says, I think every library in the world has a population we're not reaching. If we can learn ways to reach that we haven't, it has to be a win. Yeah, and that was a really good way to put it, Heidi. And that's what I always, because sometimes when I talk about these library staff and museums and everyone else, our funders are like, we already do that. We already talk to people. Stop making me try to talk to more people. But this is really about digging out further. And if you're already doing it, great. I don't care what method you use. All I care is that you're reaching out further um, into your demographics to grab those people who could probably most benefit for the services and aren't quite getting them yet. Um, I did a couple civic dinners. Mm -hmm. um, and Civic Dinners is an organization. They want to get community feedback about what could be done in various communities um, in various ways. So if you want to go to their website, you could get some ideas. And uh, they want people to uh, share their ideas over their food. Um, I did it over pizza and, you know, open it up to anybody to come. That's fantastic. Yeah, give their opinions, yeah. Yeah, and that, that's a community dialogue, right? Like, that's, yeah. that's exactly, there's so many different models of this out there. And yeah, the idea is just to talk and get people comfortable. That's fantastic, Erin. Uh, Jennifer says, we'd like to bring people together, share ideas, concerns, and needs. Absolutely. 
Yeah, and the great thing again, not dissing the general public because I am them, right? Um, but the great thing about really focusing on the leaders and the movers and the shakers is they can actually help you make those things happen. Um, oh, Aaron, thank you so much for that link. Um, they can actually make those things happen with you, right? Um, and you're not kind of, I know sometimes when I've gone to um, like community meetings, town halls type meetings, it, it, it gets a really negative feel to it towards the end because there's just so much happening and it's hard to, no one wants to say, well, we're gonna pick X idea to focus on because what about A through Y, right? Those were great ideas too. Um, so having this kind of smaller, more pointed, um, but still informal um, conversation um, really does, I, I feel like, make it a, a little more positive at the end because you can find something to rally around. Diane, that's amazing. Yeah, food. Food is like the key here. Diane says they did a potluck dinner and most of the people who showed up weren't re weekly regular patrons. Um, yes, that's so if you guys go and download the community dialogue guide, which just gives you some more pointed ideas for doing this. I think I've got pictures of food in there, food and big capital letters everywhere, like you need food. <laughs> uh, Marcia says, we're definitely trying to get a handle on our users. We are both an urban library and a suburban library uh, with 34 libraries spread throughout the Atlanta metro area and the libraries are used in different ways, in different areas. That is so hard, <laughs> having a big system, especially if you're the one in charge um, of doing this kind of outreach um, through that big system. And all of those little pockets of communities in Atlanta are so, so different. We have a coworker who's from that area and he talks about you know, how you can drive one street over and it's a completely different demographic, a completely different culture. That's hard. Um, so next question then, which I looks like I accidentally clicked through when I wasn't looking, um, is who would you guys want to invite to this sort of event? So I already gave you some of the kind of common examples. So like school board officials, your mayor, we've had governors show up, like turns out they really like these kinds of things. Um, Hispanic Chamber of Commerce, the regular Chamber of Commerce. You guys have any other ideas? Stephanie, I'm trying to remember what the fantastic was la one was last time. I wrote it on a sticky, but I don't see it. Oh yeah, head of the local homeless shelter, absolutely. Clergy leaders. Clergy leaders, yes. Churches are, I, so we're federally funded, right? And I used to be so afraid of recommending that people reach out to churches because separation of church and state, right? We, but that's not what you're going for, right? You're going to, to invite them and to realize this is where people congregate. So I cannot recommend enough now, go to the churches, go to the synagogues, go to the mosques. Um, they want to hear from you too. <laughs> so well, I don't remember which one it was too that was recommended. We'll, we'll post it when we post everything else. Uh, hurts my brain because it, it was one we'd never heard before and we've been doing this a lot. <laughs> uh. Any other ideas? Stephanie, do you have any suggestions? Oh, I always have suggestions. Um, so things to think about are Rotary Clubs, Kiwanis Clubs, uh, VFW Posts. Um, you want to look at community centers. You want to look at your local Boy Scouts and Girl Scouts. Town clerk, that's great. Town clerks know people. Mm -hmm. You know, so many people. HOA presidents, exactly, yeah. Pretty much the people who are reaching out to, you know, everybody in the neighborhood. You know, somebody always talks to somebody else. Youth leaders, absolutely. Uh, Boys and Girls Club are great examples. Boys and Girls Club, Boy Scouts, um, Girl Scouts. I know Boy Scouts for whatever council you're in uh, always has a district executive for your area. So they are a great person because they're meeting everybody. Girl Scouts is something equivalent um, to a, a district executive. 4-H, exactly. Uh, Boys and Girls Clubs. Oh, uh, Talk to your high school. Um, I grew up in Connecticut and we would have key clubs, which was through the Kiwanis. And so key clubs are all about community service. They're always looking at doing things. Um, one of the great things about community dialogues is we have one that is teen led. So it's something where you can get the teens involved and help them lead it and give them opportunities. Um, a key club would be a great way to, to reach out. I'm trying to think. I like the HOA presidents. We haven't heard that one yet. Yeah, that was a new one too. Um, a mayor's, county commissioners, any type of government leader will probably be interested. As Annie said, governors have even come. Um, I like the photo op. <laughs> yeah. Um, and you're more than welcome to say that um, 
that you did this because of because of NASA, because of NASA at my library. Throw that NASA name around and yeah, that'll work too. <laughs> yes. School superintendent, absolutely. <laughs> um, teachers, sometimes universities, if you know a professor that can uh, have interest in this, that'd be a great person too. Absolutely. You guys have been one of our most respondent groups. Thank you for that. Responsive? Responsive is the word I'm looking for. <laughs> Um, so I'm not sure, <laughs> duh, I need G, I wonder what the answer is now. Before all of this happened, we were curious what environmental issues um, you might tackle when you're having these conversations. Um, certainly, if you're having these conversations now, I bet you're going to be talking about how some mean virus has everyone stuck inside. Um, if, however, you're doing this in the fall or next spring, um, are there big, um, especially if you're planning on doing it for Earth Day, right? Um, are there any big environmental issues um, in your community or ones that predominantly impact some of those underserved and underrepresented audiences um, that you were thinking of? It kind of feels like a silly question given where we're at right now. <laughs> We've been having issues with our recycling service. Are they uh, actually throwing things in the trash? We've been hearing about that too. <laughs> Green spaces and water, yeah, that's always a huge one. Yeah, so typically when we're talking about the community dialogues, we don't really have a specific focus, um, like an environmental issue or anything like that. Um, especially when you're just meeting and getting to know all these potential partners. Um, but especially if you're having to do one online or if you're trying to do one around an event like Earth Day, having a more narrow focus um, is a good way to get people who aren't sure if they belong uh, to show up, right? Like if you're gonna say, oh, we're gonna talk about environmental issues in our community, you know, parks and rec, the water, um, water cycling, not the word, water district. Water district yeah. folks <laughs> might might show up. Um, Heidi says, we're a little community with a landfill outside of town, large cities, ew, bring their landfill crud. Danielle Crash along park paths and rivers. That's a, actually a big issue in Denver. Mm -hmm. uh, surrounded by commercial interests. There's a frontline documentary on not all plastics can be recycled. Absolutely, and a lot of people don't know that. Transportation, having dumpsters hauled off timely is an issue, also a small town. Mm -hmm. Yep. So like I can hear some of you like already like getting a little fired up. These are great <laughs> issues to use um, if you're planning on doing again like an Earth Day centered community dialogue or even just a, a civic engagement centered community dialogue. Um, again, the, the biggest concern I want to bring up is if you're doing a specific issue, um, then this is not the time where you're going to be bringing in those underserved audiences, right? This is where you're working more on partnership building and building a community effort. So, uh, yeah, garbage along the river, gentrification, where to send old books. You know, there are people that will take old books and like make fun art out of them. I'm sure it doesn't make up for the 8,000 copies of Twilight that you got donated last week, but some people will take them. <laughs> Sorry, I just always like, I'm, I'm in a bunch of the librarian meme groups and those are all my favorite when they like, like stack up all of the whatever last year's big book was and how many of them they got donated. <laughs> what is Better World Books? Is that what I was thinking of and I couldn't think of names? It could be. If you rip the covers off, books are also recyclable if the recycling actually gets recycled. <laughs> then you have to rip the books off and feel like a monster. Uh, yeah, you can send, yes, your, old you send your old books to Better World Books. That's the one. Um, so next question, this might be the last one. Um, so if you weren't having a topic specific conversation, but more just a general conversation to uh, encourage new patrons, um, are there any barriers in your own library um, that might prevent folks from participating in the conversation? Um, any reasons that you know that certain groups don't come or aren't, or maybe come, but only use certain resources. No free parking. Yeah, that's huge. <laughs> Brian, patrons would lose their minds if they saw us ripping books. It's a really good Facebook post, like an April Fool's and then explain why. 
no elevator, no bad bus routes, transportation and language barriers, parking. Um, so yeah, I see a bunch of uh, parking, elevators, access. Um, one big recommendation that a lot of our NASA signage, yes, um, a I keep interrupting myself. Um, one big thing that a lot of our NASA at my library, libraries did with their community dialogues is they hosted them somewhere else. Um, so, um, you know, maybe you've got a bookmobile or an outreach um, librarian that only goes to certain places because you know those are the places that work and you're interested in going to other places. Do a community dialogue in one of those other places and then maybe you determine, hey, you can send your outreach or your bookmobile to them. Um, one of our NASA at my library, libraries, that's really hard to say, um, was trying to work with the Native American reservation and there was no way, they, they didn't have like a book van, there was no way of getting around the physical barrier, no one, no one on the reservation except for like two people had cars and those were cars for work, right? Um, so instead that librarian um, would take a list of books to the kids and have them check down what they want. And the next week he'd bring a set of books and he just did that. I don't know if this was part of his job or not, but you know, once a week he went and switched out books. Um, and yeah, they lost some of them, but really it's not that big of a deal. Um, so just finding ways that if people can't get to you, you can get to them. Um, or maybe they have a representative who can come to you to borrow that stack of books and bring them back later. Um, certainly, we all know libraries aren't just about books, um, but that's probably a good place to start. Um, you're not going to start with like your big programs and dragging a computer lab to people, right? Um, and I like that some people are saying timing for working parents, language certainly a barrier. Um, one of the reasons we also say that you can do it outside of your library is if you are trying to reach that group and you want to have a conversation with them but they feel intimidated by coming into the library doing something at the local rec center or your community center or even a church or something where they are feeling more comfortable to go to you may be able to reach that group and have a conversation with them mm -hmm. so don't feel like you have to have it at your library you have to showcase the library you don't have to you can do these conversations mm -hmm. somewhere else and use it as a stepping stone to bring people in Right, and consider doing it dual purpose, right? So Stephanie mentioned a church. Um, if you're going to go do your community dialogue at the church, certainly let the people there know that that's part of your intention, but offer to do a program too, right? Do a program for kids and families and then follow it up with the conversation. Um, this doesn't have to be like some set in stone kind of thing. If you can get people to come by offering a cool program and then they'll stay and talk to you, that sounds great to me. Um, we've also had some shy librarians, I have personally never met one, but they claim they exist, um, who did not want to have an actual conversation. They just weren't comfortable doing that. Um, so what they did instead was, again, they did a family program at, oh God, I can't remember. I think it was like the county fair or something, right? So a place that did not at all one-to-one -one represent the people who came to the library. And they just set up like stations, right? So you had to go in order through their booth. Station one was a cool robot activity. Station two was write down your thoughts about XYZ at the library or why you don't use it or um, if you love it but don't go why, right? And then station three was another activity. Station four was another question. Um, so there's a lot of unique ways. Again, the important thing is getting the questions to the people you don't see every day because I know you're already getting answers from them. Get them out to other people. Uh, so yeah, Heidi said for disposing of books, they take them to a local low income after school program to get books to the kids that don't get to come to the library. Um, Diane says they have a patron that takes discards to leave in free take one box and dentist office. That's a great idea. I swear when <laughs> I, I've spent so much money in the, the, the store, right, in my two local libraries. And then when they put stuff in the free box, oh, can't control myself. Um, you could also, um, and I just came up with this right now, so it might be a bad idea, but it just popped into my head. Um, you can make a giant stack of, of books you're trying to get rid of and encourage patrons to start their own little free library, right? Um, can't do that right now, but maybe you could in the future. <laughs> yeah, my own neighborhood has one of those little, like, take a book, put a mm -hmm. book like little things over by the, um, the golf course. Yeah, great way to give people starters and then they can add their own stuff later. So what are other barriers you guys think? Oh, <laughs> oh that was me. Um, what are other barriers you guys think could prevent you from having one of these?
I know something that I did forget to mention when we talked about who would you invite is if you're nervous about reaching out to people or if you're nervous they're going to say no, um, always end a conversation with whether they say yes or whether they say no, but always end it with great. Is there anybody else I should talk to? Um, it's a great way to kind of build your own network and it also helps build the network for the library because everybody knows someone else. Is that idea of six degrees of separation. So by talking to the local car dealership owner, he may know the Chamber of Commerce president who then knows the mayor in town and you don't, you never know what connections you'll find just by asking who to talk to. So if that's one of your barriers is you're just not sure where to start, start asking some of your patrons, hey, I want to do this. Who's someone I should talk to? And that might help kind of set you on your path to finding people. And two of our libraries accidentally found a wealthy donor that way. <laughs> That's true. You can get money that way too, without even intentionally doing right. it. They didn't ask, but they got a check. Um, all right. So let's uh, keep going here. Um, capacity might be a barrier. That's absolutely true. Uh, turnout tends to be low for non-children's programs, no matter what it is. So it's a great plan to have a children's uh, thing during the day. Yep. Scope capacity. Yeah, totally. Totally. So, yeah, and we recommend too that uh, try to have childcare available for these because you may find that you like movers and shakers could be that awesome PTA mom, but you know, she needs to bring her kids, you know, she, there's not somebody to take care of them. Make sure you kind of maybe have a program or something going on so that way people feel more welcome. Mm -hmm. Or conversely, just let them know that kids are totally welcome and you'll have stuff out on the floor for them. That's what the, um, the library in Broward County did. They just threw a bunch of robots and Legos on the floor. And at first the parents were like, oh, shh, shh, be quiet. But at the, by the end, you know, we were just yelling over them and everyone was having a great time. The kids found the food before we did. It was fantastic. <laughs> um, so real quick, just want to let you guys know um, about some of the resources um, you can use if you are interested in conducting a community dialogue. Number one, the resources are me and Stephanie. If you have questions, don't go digging through stuff. You can just ask us. It's totally fine. Um, but we do also have on the Starnet Library's website um, a whole community dialogue page. Um, that has the guide. If you're like, I don't know how to ask people to come. Oh, we made an invitation template for you. You just have to go put your name and their name on it. Um, so a lot of uh, template things like that. Any pictures that you see either in the guide or on the website, if you want to use them for publicity or to kind of show people what these look like, you're more than welcome to do that. That's what they're there for. Um, and then there's also in there, you can't see it on this page, um, but there's some links out to other similar programs um, that we've either borrowed from or they borrowed from us, um, but other people doing this kind of work. So again, um, my big pitch is I really don't care how you do this. I just care that it gets done. So if someone else's framework works better, go for it. Um, sorry, I saw some notes. Let me go to that real quick. Coloring corner and toys or something. Yep. Welcoming kids is a good option too. Yeah, absolutely. At first I was like thinking these are like, like stodgy, very important events. The mayor might be here. Eh, it's about the community. The community includes everybody, right? Um, I've also been shocked a couple times when teens were brought and they were just going to sit in the corner and do their homework or play on their DS or something. And like, we're talking about something and I see him, I see him kind of put the DS down. They kind of look up, they kind of start to lean forward. And I was like, D do you have something? And Oh my gosh, we've gotten such good insight out of out of the uh, the tweens and teens who have been kind of brought along as a as a tag along, and they're like, you know, one of them was, you're talking about this stuff that tweens might like to do. That's all terrible and awful. What you need to do is X Y Z thing that the library is now doing, and the tweens show up for right. Um, so even if you're not going to do a whole teen led dialogue where the teens are talking to other kids. Um, no harm in inviting, you know, if you have a teen advisory board, invite some of them. They're really good contributors to this kind of thing. Um, I think this might be the last slide. Um, I wanted to encourage you, um, if you are doing one of these dialogues in person in the future um, and you want to, you know, use an activity as an icebreaker, 
um, or just show people the type of programs that you do, please consider uh, checking out the STEM Activity Clearinghouse. Um, obviously, most of you know about it. Lots of good free stuff on there that you can do um, pretty easily. There's also, um, we are in the process of making a collection, but I don't think it's up yet, um, of either take and make or um, easy at home activities with stuff that you're bound to have like <laughs> toilet paper tubes. <laughs> Everyone's got those now they're all empty. Um, but so you could also pick things like that right and literally if you're doing an online dialogue have people do an activity in the middle of that too. Um, I've definitely found because I've observed 20 some of dialogues at this point, the ones that open with an icebreaker or an activity, it sure feels cheesy when you're doing it. But those are the conversations where people talk more and talk to each other more. So even if it hurts you a little like it hurts me, um, icebreakers are good in this context. Uh, if you do decide to use one of the activities, do make sure to leave a review um, so we can either make it better for you or so that other people know that it's a good activity for this sort of thing. Ah, and that is the end of my slideshow. Um, got 10 minutes left. Um, certainly no one feel obligated to stick around, but if anyone has any questions, um, Stephanie and I will stick around for a little bit. We're happy to answer. Um, and again, thank you guys for showing up, even though craziness is going on. Do keep your eyes peeled for that um, weekly newsletter about stay-at-home activities. And if you have any questions, you need any help, you want a program, please email me or Stephanie. We're happy to get that set up for you. Thanks, guys. <laughs>